Good to see you. Hey. What's happening? Joe. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you about a bunch of things, but uh, I've been paying attention to all the uh, Webb telescope stuff. Oh, my gosh. Fascinating. It's all that. Could you please explain the difference in the ability of the capabilities of this telescope versus what we've had previously? Yeah. So, first of all, it's all that. And the excitement was in part because so much could have gone wrong with this thing. And the fact that nothing went wrong, we were ecstatic. Could you explain how complicated it is yeah. to get something Here, like that? Yeah, here's so one of the great challenges that we face is how do you put a telescope in orbit that's bigger than the rocket that's going to launch it? Is that even possible? And the Hubble telescope, do you know what set the size of that 94 inch diameter mirror? That's the biggest mirror you could fit in the payload of the space shuttle. Oh. That's what set the size of that telescope. Big as it was, we would have made it bigger if the space shuttle were bigger. Now, I don't know if you've seen the Hubble telescope. There's a replica of it at the Air and Space Museum. And, let's, and, take a, let's take a photo of it. Uh, and it'll just, it's there hanging from the ceiling, but if you want to know how, it's about the size of a Greyhound bus. So the space shuttle deployed a Greyhound bus into orbit, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. And the, the value of the Hubble was that you could update it by with servicing missions and it was serviced many times and as a result it lived within our culture for three decades there are people who came of age only ever knowing the majesty of the universe as delivered to you by the hubble telescope 30 years worth of this think about it mm. most other telescopes they put into orbit and they have a five-year mission and then they come down so they don't have a chance to get to get inside you to become something that you that you, uh, oh, you got a nice uh, visual there. So that's the Hubble telescope on the left, which every year, every year I post a tweet <laughs> at the end of the Stanley Cup, and I say, the Stanley Cup and the Hubble telescope had the same designer. <laughs> really? Just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, just look at the thing. Oh. It looks like the Stanley Cup. A little uh, bit. Just a lot. I wouldn't confuse the two if they were in a room together. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. So notice the Hubble telescope, its diameter is, is the spherical shape that fits in the spherical payload of the space shuttle. So now we want to put a bigger telescope into orbit. How do you do that? And so this is where you need engineers, clever engineers. We say, here's a rocket, one of the most powerful rockets we can use, but the fairing, that's the place where you hold the payload, can only be so big. And they say, all right, why don't we fold the telescope? Now, how are you going to fold the mirror? Oh, you turn the mirror into segments, hexagons. Hexagons, one of only three shapes that can tile a surface, a square, a triangle, and a hexagon. No other shape can do this. So, well, you can have other irregular shapes that can match up. You can tessellate what it's called. But if you have a rate, what's called a regular polygon, so here uh, uh, in the image there, what you can see is all of the mirror segments. Those fold into a narrow structure along with the, the unfurling uh, 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 solar panels as well as the heat shields. Uh, notice how it's made at Northrop Grumman. By the way, Grumman has a long history in helping NASA put stuff in space. The LEM, Lunar Excursion Module, remember that? The thing mm -hmm. that landed on the moon? That was designed and built in Bethpage, Long Island at Grumman Aerospace. And so this is, and you go to Bethpage today, people still stand tall because they had aunts and uncles who worked on that project. Space is a, is a force of nature unto itself in our sense of pride, in our sense of achievement, and our sense of what f operates on civilization to take us into the future, lest we continue to regress and move back into the cave mm. which we came. There it is all folded up in the image we now see for those oh, wow. who are watching this. And you slip that into a fairing, and then you launch it a million miles from Earth, opposite the sun from Earth. and it unfurls like petals of a flower. Is there an animation of how that oh, yeah. goes down? Yeah, they have, yeah slow-mo animation. Sure, he can find it. And it's the deployment, uh, how it deployed as it was on its way 
to its location, which is one of the Lagrangian points in orbit. For every two objects that orbit each other, there are five Lagrangian oh, points. So here we are unfolding. So there we have solar panels coming out the side, and there's the uh, communication uh, antenna, and it has a unique set of baffles that shield it from sunlight so that the mirror and the detector can be very, very cold because it's designed, it's specially tuned to observe infrared that comes to us from space. Mm. And infrared, as you may know, we, we normally associate it with heat. Well, how am, how am I gonna detect something that's very, very cold in space if my detector is hotter than what I'm trying to detect? Mm. You can't, you, there's no way to see something that is warmer than the temperature of your detector. So your detector has to be very cold, extremely cold. So these are the baffles, and there are many, many layers. So that when sunlight hits one layer, that layer absorbs it and re-radiates it in both directions, forward and back. So there's less that goes to the next layer. So then the next layer re-radiates it, and it, by the time it gets to the fourth layer, hardly anything goes towards the telescope. And so it is insulated, and it drops to deep space cold temperatures. And it's literally where the sun don't shine right now. So the solar panels are getting this solar energy from the bottom. Yeah, because that's the direction the sun is, correct. So it radiates off the bottom, and those are the things that protect it. And uh, we see how all those layers All the layers, yeah. yeah. Amazing. It's, it's, yeah, and, and it's specifically tuned for the infrared part of the spectrum. You remember the spectrum. So you have like visible light, right? Uh, we, Roy G. Biv, right, if you want to remember it. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Those are the parts of the spectrum we can see. But there's light outside of this. There's like beyond the violet, there's ultraviolet. That's where, how you get that. And below the red is infrared. Not visible to the human eye. By the way, insects can see ultraviolet. We can't. That's oh. why bug zappers work. You put a UV light in a bug zapper, the, the, the bugs say, oh my gosh, I love ultraviolet, and then they get zapped. And we're old enough to remember before there were bug zappers, you'd had a, a picnic bulb for, uh, for twilight picnics, and it's like a yellow bulb, kind of yellow amber bulb. It was a bug bulb. It was sold as bug bulbs. It's not that they repelled bugs. It's that the bugs couldn't even see it because their whole vision is shifted towards the ultraviolet. Oh. And it leaves out the deep red. Yeah, oh. so it's that's evidence we're smarter than bugs. <laughs> <laughs>